This third panel is going to be focusing on humanity in the universe. And I'd like to, before we get into that subject matter, read from greetings sent from the LaRouche South African movement to our conference, from Philip Sokolabane. We'll then have a musical offering, and then the panel will begin. Philip Sokolabane writes, it is time to finally heed the wisdom of Lyndon LaRouche. On behalf of the LaRouche movement in South Africa, I send my greetings to all of you assembled at this important conference and offer my best wishes for your success. I truly believe that the fate of Africa, and for that matter, all of mankind, rests on the success of this relative handful of people gathered here and around the globe who are committed to moving the world into a new world order based on peace and progress. He writes, we have come to a point at which mankind must finally grow into maturity and throw off the shackles, both mental and physical, imposed by the dying paradigm of British imperialism, shackles that have kept mankind enslaved. This is a moment at which revolutionary change is possible, but it calls for the action of revolutionaries who are committed to the principles on which this new order must be founded, that each and every human being has been given by our creator the power of creative reason a power that enables us both to see into and shape a future that is born in the human imagination and is brought into being by human actions in the present. This power of sentient reason is what distinguishes man from any other of our maker's creations. It is the most powerful force. We will post the entirety of Mr. Sokolobane's greetings on the conference website. I will read his conclusion. Had the world listened then to President Jose Lopez Portillo of Mexico City when he said in 1998 that it is now necessary for the world to listen to the wise words of Lyndon LaRouche, if that had been listened to, today we might have avoided the last 20 years of the tragedy, the bloodshed, and the horrors of British imperial domination. There is now only one solution to the world's current existential crisis. It must finally heed the wisdom of Lyndon LaRouche and act to bring his revolutionary vision for a new world order into being. I, for one, commit my life to that endeavor. LaRouche, South Africa, Philip Sokolobane. We will now hear from Yu Ting Zhou, a Johannes Brahms Rhapsody.
The human mind is the source of all economic wealth. The human mind is the source of the distinction between us and all of the animals. And there is no field in which the human mind is brought more to bear than in our exploits and ex explorations and endeavors out into space. We're going to have a wonderful panel tonight around the theme of man in the heavens. And I'd like to begin the panel with some words from Lyndon LaRouche, who in 1988 if we can get the lights dimmed here. In 1988, ran a campaign video called The Woman on Mars. And we're going to see the, the beginning of the video now.
first permanent colony on Mars is now fully operational. Many of you are shocked. Some of you are saying, why is this old geezer talking about a permanent colony on Mars 39 years from now with the major budget problems in Washington today? In a nationwide television broadcast a few weeks ago, I told you that on my first day as president, I should declare a national economic emergency and launch the largest economic recovery program in our history. During each of the first two years of my administration, about $2 trillion in low-cost federal loans will be invested in building up our nation's presently rotting industrial infrastructure, plus building up about 5 million new industrial jobs during the first three or four years of my administration. Looking back to the experience of the 1940-1943 period under President Franklin Roosevelt, we know that the recovery will creak at the beginning, but will build up speed over the first two years so that about the third year, the United States will have the highest per capita income in our history. There are no mysterious tricks involved. It is all basic economics modeled upon our successful economic recoveries under Franklin Roosevelt and John F. Kennedy. However, to keep that recovery going beyond the first three to four years, and to make our economy once again the most competitive on Earth, we must invest in creating new technologies to do that. We must pick up where we left off with the old Apollo program back during the 1960s. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. And the others, too. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Tower cleared. Here we got a roll program. Neil Armstrong reporting the roll and pitch program, which puts Apollo 11 on a proper heading. The old aerospace program of the 1960s paid us back more than 10 cents for every penny we invested in it. This Mars program will pay us back much more. Not 40 years from now, but each year, over the 50 years or more to come. This project spin-offs in the form of new products and new technologies into our civilian economy means that by the year 2027 AD, the average person in the United States will have a real income at least 10 times that of today. That is bold thinking. Our panelists today include a number of people involved, uh, well, at least a couple people involved uh, in that mission that you saw there. We're first going to be hearing from Keisha Rogers who is a member of the LaRouche Pack Policy Committee. She comes from Houston, Texas to us today. She is a multi-time candidate for US Congress, securing the Democratic Party nomination 
not just once, and forcing a runoff in her bid for U.S. Senate from the state of Texas. Please welcome Keisha Rogers. Thank, thank you, Jason, and thank you all for being here today. It is a pleasure to see so many people here that are passionate about our space program as I am and the great vision and mission for mankind. Let me just start off by thanking you again for being here and I want to thank Helga for her vision and inspiration for bringing this conference together. Thank you. It's it is because of the vision and life's work of Lyndon and Helga LaRouche, dedicated to the progress of mankind, that we gather here today. I'm happy to be joined on the panel today by some extraordinary individuals and speakers who I've had the pleasure of meeting when Lyndon LaRouche asked me uh, and we talked about running for office and the idea for a campaign around the revival of our space program. And after I saw this video that, that Jason just showed, I vowed that I would dedicate myself to fulfilling that mission. And I don't come from technical, scientific background. I did it as someone who represents the ordinary man in this vision for the ordinary man. And I am proud of the support that I've received from a number of people within our space program that understand that that wasn't just a vision of the past, that the space program is not just something of the past, but something that drives us into the future. Now, the passion that we see exhibited in our space program has to continue. And I want to start my topic and my remarks today on the theme, the frontiers of space, fulfilling mankind's destiny as man in the universe, as we see here. This year, our nation and the world will celebrate the 50th anniversary of the first humans to walk on the surface of the moon in July of 1969. Many of you may remember where you were. I was not even thought about yet. <laughs> this, now this year, just to think about it, is also the 47th anniversary of the last humans to walk on the moon. Nobody celebrates the ending of our human sp lunar space program because we are proud of achieving a leading role in space, not of abandoning that role. It is time to reclaim our destiny, not merely as a space-observing civilization with our impressive arrays of space satellites, telescopes, and rovers, but as a space-colonizing civilization. As the vision of Mr. LaRouche demonstrated clearly in that video that we just watched. And this requires fundamentally rethinking not only the importance of human space exploration in itself, but also requires rediscovering what it means to be truly human in the first place, and realizing how that is inseparable from our destiny as man in the universe. This dedication to the mission of advancing our understanding of human destiny of mankind in the universe has been the lifelong commitment of Lyndon LaRouche and his relationship in the simultaneity of eternity with all the great visionaries and classical minds that came before him and those who will come after. Reclaiming our destiny in space will not merely require having the right space vehicle, so advanced technology. It requires, as LaRouche has declared, shedding at last the cultural residue of the beast. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you to the Burke family. <laughs> Thirty-four years ago, in 1985, speaking at a memorial conference of the Schiller Institute in honor of the great space pioneer, Kraft Erika, Lyndon LaRouche reflected at the time, quote, each of us is born, each of us must die. Within that brief interval of life, what distinguishes a life as human? as exalted above the condition of mere beast, is that which the individual contributes to the enduring benefit of future generations. He goes on later to say, there in the stars lies mankind's entry into the long, long awaited age of reason. When our species sheds at last the cultural residue of the beast. Now, let us look back to the brief life of President John F. Kennedy and his opening of this door into the age of reason. On May 25, 1961, President Kennedy announced before a special joint session of Congress the dramatic and ambitious goal of sending an American safely to the moon and returning him to Earth before the end of the decade. The achievement of such a bold undertaking for the nation of accomplishing a mission that had never been attempted by any other nation was not going to be done on a whim or a gamble. It required, as Kennedy understood clearly, long-term and visionary leadership, economic, an economic driver and a scientific driver. As he clearly stated, Quote, now it is time to take longer strides, time for a great new American enterprise, time for this nation to take a clearly leading role in space achievement, which in many ways may hold the key to our future on Earth. Quote, I believe we possess all the resources and talents necessary but the fact of the matter are that we have never made the national decisions or marshaled the national resources required for such leadership. We have never specified long range goals on an urgent time schedule or managed our resources and our time so as to ensure their fulfillment. Now, the Apollo program wasn't just a fly-by-night program. This program would become the, one of the greatest economic drivers the nation would ever experience. It never had to do with merely planting a flag on the moon before the Soviets and saying, been there, done that. It was a commitment to what Kraft Erika had called an open world system or a pro-growth paradigm. And we'll come to this in just a moment. In the course of eventually sending six missions to the moon, we permanently increased the standard of living worldwide through thousands of spin-offs and collaboration among nations. These missions were to prepare the way for further exploration, development, and eventually permanent interplanetary settlements, such as with Kraft Erika's conception of Selenopolis, which is a depiction of a space colony on the moon, and Lyndon LaRouche's conception of Kepleropolis on Mars. Quite uh, visionaries in their artistic minds. Now, just to look at this for a second, the consequences of a growth paradigm are the idea of making a conscious decision of no limits to growth, of technological improvements, 
of the advances of the living standards of your population, uh, of actually having a growing birth rate. And I'll just take a couple of seconds there for you to see when we shed off all limitations to growth, this is what launches us into an open world system where there's no limitations to man's progress in the universe. But the full realization of that vision, as I explained earlier, exemplified by our space program with the Apollo mission, with the vision of later of Kraft Erika and of Lyndon LaRouche, was shattered as our nation and world were plunged into the budget-cutting zero-growth economy of a closed world system, which started in full gear after the assassination of President Kennedy and led to a permanent state of war, as we've seen and many of us have lived our entire lives in, fake growth programs like the idiotic Green New Deal that you'll hear a lot more about on this panel today, and the resurgence of what I would call an egotistical identity politics that has nothing to do with who we are as human beings. Under today's no growth or closed world economy, it is treated, and the economy is treated like one of those all-you-can-eat buffets <laughs> at the table restaurants. So every sector has its own dish. Uh, none is more or less important than the other. If you like space, you put it on your plate. If you like high-speed trains, you put it on your plate. If you don't like Brussels sprouts, don't pick any of that. If you don't like Wall Street gambling, you know, don't pick that. You know, you grab what you like. Now, I'm going to tell you that this approach to humanity's long-term survival on the planet and in the solar system is not merely wrong opinion, but it is tragic and condemns human civilization to a miserable existence of poverty, war, and eventual extinction sooner or later. Bees, oh, let's go back for me, please are the consequences of a no-growth system. So you may continue. Thank you. So a far better metaphor to imagine human economy is a vehicle driving us to our destination. If our destination is to raise society above the poverty line, to eliminate poverty completely, I don't believe in raising above the poverty line. I think we have to completely eliminate poverty. If our destination is to eliminate horrible diseases, to stop wars, to end cancer and AIDS, then the economy, as Lyndon LaRouche made clear, in his earlier video on the woman on Mars is the means by which we get to our destination. In this metaphor, the vehicle economy is what is important. What is the important part of the vehicle? How does it, what, what makes it drive? Engine, Engine. excellent. Absolutely. And the most powerful engine known to man is human space exploration. Think about it. Why human space exploration? And not something else. Why not more money <laughs> in the economy? Because humanity is a space-based civilization. We live in our galaxy and solar system. And whether you think about it or not, your day-to-day -day life is profoundly affected by 
the activity of space. This is most obvious with the sun, but also frequent in catastrophes like what space weather, asteroids, asteroid impacts. I don't know if people remember this, but yesterday was the sixth anniversary of Chelyabinsk over Russia, the meteor that hit over, that exploded over Russia. More importantly, uh, the millions, what it affects is the millions of ways uh, that technology and spinoffs from human space exploration permanently increase the standard of living of society everywhere it touches. Quite simply, the most efficient driver of human progress, the one thing that gets us to our destination of eliminating poverty, disease, and war the fastest is human space exploration. This may not seem so obvious, but it should be very clear as we think about the subject and theme of this entire conference and what we're doing to raise a new epic of mankind. The achievement of a permanent lunar presence is the gateway to the development of human economy in space and is essential to the development of a productive economy and city building here on Earth. So, just want to take a moment here, because this uh, very much reflects the work of Mr. LaRouche's fourth law in his Four Laws for an Economic Recovery. Here we see a basic schematic of a plasma torch. The idea here is everything from seawater to landfill waste can be treated into a plasma where it becomes magnetic. And then individual elements can be mined from that, uh, like gold and iron ore, and can be distilled out of the, their isotopic levels and used used in the economy. Uh, this is one reason why Lyndon LaRouche has emphasized that the program for the economic development of the moon in conjunction with the crash program for fusion would be one of the most important scientific drivers programs for mankind. Fusion, as we see here and will be explained further, uh, does not just help us for making faster rockets or abundant electricity. It allows us to have complete control over the isotopes of the periodic table. Just a quote from Mr. LaRouche here, as you can read alone. It says, quote, progress exists only under the continuing progressive increase of the productive and related powers of the human species. That progress defines the absolute distinction of the human species from all other presently known to us. A fusion economy is the presently urgent next step and standard for man's gain of power within the solar system later and beyond." End quote. So just going to take a few minutes here because I'd like to just to look at some of the work that's now going on, uh, impressive work that is happening uh, on this question of fusion. There is a three minute quick video that I'd like to uh, highlight here, which shows the potential. Uh, and this, the gentleman who, uh, Mr. Uh, Poulinets, who actually worked uh, works with the Fusion Plasma Laboratory, uh, has given a presentation on helium-3 and an interview uh, to our organization before. And they have an impressive new program that they're working on, on fusion for long-term space exploration. So if you can go ahead and start that. Thank you. 
direct fusion drive is a new concept of propulsion based on fusion energy, and it provides in a single package both propulsion and electrical power. So this direct fusion drive is really a game-changing technology, enabling us to reach deep space destinations much faster and with vast amounts of electric power. NASA is interested in a variety of deep space destinations, such as getting to Jupiter in one year, Saturn in two years, Pluto in four to five years. A single DFD engine on the smaller side, so a one megawatt DFD engine can do any of those missions. We can literally fly straight to Pluto, fly straight to Jupiter, do not stop, do not pass go, do not collect $200, fly directly to your destination. And that's a dramatically different way to operate deep space missions. It will save time, it will save money, and we'll be able to do more science when we get there. DFD is still under development at the Princeton Plasma Physics Lab. In DFD, rotating magnetic fields created by antennas on the front and back of the vessel and on top on the bottom create current in the plasma and that current helps to confine the plasma and to heat the plasma to about one billion degrees centigrade. So the purpose of the DFD is to make thrust, but the fusion reactor makes energy, it makes energetic particles. So you have to convert that energy into thrust. We do that by allowing the fusion particles, the fusion products, to pass through the scrape off layer, heating up the plasma there, and that plasma shoots out the nozzle, generating the thrust. DFD is different from other fusion concepts because it is much, much smaller. Ours, which you can see behind here, would be about the size of a minivan. The current machine, PFRC2, very efficiently heats electrons, and we're upgrading the power supplies so that we can heat ions. If we can heat the ions in this machine to about 10 million degrees centigrade, we could prove some of the physics theories that have told us we can make a fusion reactor. A one megawatt power plant is ideal for a wide variety of applications. This includes military forward power, remote power, portable power, emergency power, powering mines in the Yukon, and powering spacecraft. There's a lot of interest in searching for life on Europa, which is one of the moons of Jupiter. We could get there in one year with just a single DFD engine. With a few kilograms of fuel, we'd have enough power for more than 10 years. We could deflect asteroids that might be coming towards the Earth that would cause major damage. Working on this is very meaningful. The ability to provide power to people on the Earth, the ability to explore the uh, its planetary system, to go beyond the planetary system, we are excited about the future because DFD opens the door to new applications that are not possible today. Excuse, if, excuse me, if I may make a correction, I think I pronounced the name wrong on the direct fusion. Uh, Mr. Palusak uh, is the name. Um, so in concluding, my remarks, I'd like to go back to the great visionary Kraft Erika, who is a great friend and collaborator, mentor of uh, Lyndon LaRouche and Helga Zepp LaRouche, and whose, all whose dedication to the true cause of space continues to ins inspire us. Uh, Kraft Erika had a paper called The Lunar Industrialization and Settlements, which he develops five stages of lunar development centered on the increase of what Erica calls the human sector. Now, because of time, I'm not going to go through all of the beautiful uh, developments of Kraft Erika's conception of uh, lunar colonization and uh, lunar settlement, but I just want to finally read this quote to encapsulate everything in which that represents and his vision stood for. He says, quote, the most important aspect of lunar development lies in the human sector. It bears repeating that techno technological progress and environmental expansion are no substitutes for human growth and maturity, but they can help the human reach higher maturity and wisdom, end quote. So again, that is our mission, to shed off the cultural residue of the beast and at last enter into the long-awaited age of reason. 
Let us again dedicate ourselves to the future of mankind as the creator intended for us as man in the universe. I thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Keisha. Our next speaker will be speaking on what NASA has done and where NASA is going. He chaired the Oceanographic Section of the World Congress on Oceans in Qingdao, China in 2017. Please welcome founding member of NASA's The Right Climate Stuff, Tom Weissmuller. Thank you, Jason. Uh, let me just start, by the way, by letting you know that Keisha says what she means, and she means what she says. We've been involved with uh, Keisha down in Houston, had a number of presentations that she's organized. She's been invited to the NASA TRC TRCS group. Uh, she is a firm believer in the continuity of the space program, and I applaud your efforts that way. Thank you. Well, you see my first slide, 60 years, on, and we're back on track and getting better. Now, most of you don't even know that we're back on track, but we really are. Uh, we've had uh, almost a moratorium on s space development over the last number of years. Now, see if I can move these slides. I'm going to talk about what we have done, how NASA has benefited not just America, but the world. And uh, then I'm going to talk about where we're going to be going. Here we go. Now, these are the categories we're going to be covering. We've had advances in aeronautics and spacecraft design, chemistry, clothing, electronics, exploration, medicine, physics, and maybe most important, technology management, because that's where NASA really excelled. Now, let's look at some of these things. We have safer aircraft because of NASA research on wind shear sensing. The pilot now has information that ahead of the plane, there's wind shear. This is developed by the agency. A non-destructive testing, that's what NDT means, uh, for aircraft soundness, engine parts, so that you don't have to break a piece of metal to find out when it's gonna break. And you don't have to take apart a plane. Uh, that saves an awful lot of money. Human factors training is how uh, people behave in the cockpit under emergencies. That has been credited by saving a number of aircraft in emergency situation. NASA developed that technique. Uh, we've also pioneered research on lightning effects, not just by planes getting hit by lightning, but uh, ground controls, radars, and uh, th their effects. And we've been able to harden airports so that they don't get affected by lightning strikes. Uh, spacecraft hatch door fixes. Uh, most of you know about a tragic fire that was on the pad where the astronauts couldn't get out of one of the early Apollo uh, flights. Uh, one of the uh, Apollo uh, flights landed in the ocean and the astronaut couldn't get out. We have, we have to change that. Uh, now we have uh, easy egress in, in emergencies, uh, big advancements there. Heat shield systems we've improved, uh, International Space Station, uh, structural integrity. Uh, the station, by the way, has components and modules that were developed in a number of countries. Canada has one, Japan has one, uh, ESA has one, but we've been able to put them together and manage so that the ISS is structurally sound. It's been flying there for a number of years and have hundreds of astronauts have visited it. How about chemistry? Most of you are aware of plastic wraps and, and space foods and things like that, but carbon fiber materials were developed by NASA. They're lightweight, good for building things in space. Uh, advancements in metallurgy, particularly powder metallurgy, uh, coating, uh, jet planes don't, uh, could not fly as well as they did without the powder metallurgy that makes turbine blades harder and less subject to heat strain. Uh, battery development, fuel cell development. Fuel cells were important. Uh, you know, if we're gonna, even if thinking about building a, a lunar uh, uh, outpost, 
propulsion maneuvering for spacecraft. We've had sometimes jets that got stuck. In fact, Neil Armstrong was selected as the uh, first person to land on the moon because he had saved a prior mission where the spacecraft was out of control with an open fuel jet that was stuck and the spacecraft was rotating. He was doing something like, like uh, almost one RPM per second, okay? Uh, and he, he managed to save the mission and his life and his uh, uh, astronaut Duke's life too. Uh, <clears throat> environmental chemistry, uh, all kinds of issues in, exist in space where astronauts have to be uh, aware of. We have detectors on satellites that see what's going on on the planet. We've, we've made major milestones in understanding our, our planet uh, from space. Clothing. Um, <clears throat> most of you are probably wearing some clothing that was improved by NASA. Integration of synth synthetics and natural fibers, uh, fireproof documents, uh, garments. Uh, every firefighter in the country now wears material that was developed by NASA here on Earth. Uh, lightweight insulation, fastening, and not just Velcro, but other fascinating systems. Uh, Spacesuit technology spin-offs are all over the place. Uh, bulletproof uh, outerwear. Uh, police departments all over the world have them. Soldiers have them. In electronics, one of the problems we had at early space flight was that we, uh, things were heavy. Spacecrafts were heavy. Uh, vacuum tubes were heavy. So transistor development, uh, we did not invent the transistor at NASA, but we improved it and then we uh, abetted it by uh, integrated circuit development, all designed to shrink the electronics, make them lighter, and make them more effective. Uh, we have you know, antenna development, laser ranging, uh, worldwide GPS, none of that would have happened without NASA. Uh, remote sensing, uh, th this is uh, s sensing things from, f from far away, uh, including uh, the astronaut's bloodstream. So we could sense that and, and send it back to Earth and, and let people know that the these astronauts are pretty healthy. Uh, imaging systems improved markedly. The, the early pho earliest photographs of the landers on the moon were, were pretty grainy. Uh, now we have tack sharp uh, imaging systems. A number of household electronics have been improved. And, you know, blenders, vacuum uh, cleaners, uh, all, all have been abetted by technology that developed develop at NASA. For expo exploration, the Hubble Space Telescope uh, opened up the universe. We are the only species on this planet that can con conceive of a Hubble t Space Telescope, send it up there, and know what we're looking at. Uh, and, and it took us quite a while to get that going, and I'll talk about that a little, briefly a little bit later. Uh, 250 robotic rover and lander missions on the moon, on Venus, on Mars, and some of them are still functioning. Uh, <clears throat> antenna development so that we can actually get signals back and forth. Uh, camera data transmission, uh, transmission rates have been improved. Uh, we've gotten lots of rocks. We actually have 14 rocks from Mars that we found on Earth because they matched the composition of rocks that we knew were on Mars. We found them on, on Antarctica. It must have been a meteor that blasted into Mars millions of years ago, and we could find Martian rocks buried in the ice in Antarctica. Uh, interesting near-Earth orbit uh, Asteroid monitoring, we didn't have that before. We know that there was a giant asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs and one that hit uh, Chesapeake Bay 35 million years ago. We have advanced warning now, we never had that. Uh, solar observation, sun's the most important thing for life on this planet. Without the sun, we're all gone. Uh, NASA has learned an awful lot about the sun, sending satellites near the sun. We have now a satellite inside the orbit of Mercury studying the sun. Medicine, well, you can't walk into a hospital today and not be positively affected by developments that NASA helped uh, bring along. Uh, 
vascular uh, pumps so that you can do a heart transplant without and, and continue the, the body circulation going. Uh, that was a, a development that was abetted by NASA. Uh, infrared temperature sensing, you can now go uh, into a hospital. Uh, they can sense your temperature without touching a mucous membrane. That was a great spread of disease. Uh, basically, they look at the infrared signal coming off your eardrum. They don't have to touch anything, they will get you sick. Uh, lots of medical monitoring techniques, remote sensing, uh, human safety, f food hazard analysis. When you have a long-term mission in the space station or uh, a Apollo spacecraft, food can spoil. We have learned what makes food spoil, how to prevent it from spoiling. Uh, that's been passed on. Uh, artificial limb design. Uh, we've learned from designing the legs on robotic explorers how to better improve the legs on people who have prosthetic legs and arms. Uh, <clears throat> in physics, basic research has been abetted by NASA, the space telescopes and things like that. We now know with precision where the planets are. That's what I mean by solar system metrics. Astronomy advancement has been stunning. And uh, we're about to launch the Webb telescope that's going to uh, see the universe in, in different wavelengths. I'm going to recommend postponement of that, and I'll tell you why in a little, in a little bit. Uh, energy management, uh, better communication, uh, not just from Earth to space and between the planets, but here on Earth. Uh, Radio signals uh, are, are easy. We're able to uh, transmit radio signals and TV signals far uh, better than we did in the 1950s and 60s when we first started doing the research. Uh, thermal research, aviation and aeronautical systems and safety. Uh, your planes are safer. The A in NASA stands for aeronautics, and National Aeronautics and Space Administration. There's a whole section of the agency that, that, that does this. I'm just gonna sign a better speed things up here. Uh, here's something that NASA had started, open patents. If we had a, a patent that gave NASA uh, information technology, it was an open patent. Everybody could use it. It was not a secret, it was not sealed. Uh, CPFF is cost plus fixed fee and cost plus incentive fee at CPIF. If we wanted to do something that we didn't know could be done, we would ask contractors to uh, do the research and we would pay them an incentive fee if they got it right. And uh, sometimes they, we, we had no idea we could do it right. Uh, Progress reporting, that's program evaluation and, and research techniques. Change order system, KT stands for Kepner Trago. That was the problem solving system that figured out what happened to Apollo 13. Uh, and that was a situation where we had no evidence whatsoever, hard evidence to look at, and we figured out what happened. Uh, most important maybe is, is down here, the work breakdown structure. In order to send a spacecraft to, to Mars, to the moon, you have to know every little piece of information that has to happen. Some of them, well, we would color code them. Green would be something that we know some we, we could build. Uh, orange would be something that you know, maybe we could build it. Red was that, oh, oh this is not gonna work. We have to do something to find out. And we did those work breakdown structures for every launch, every uh, moon mission. They were stunningly competent. Why? Because when all the blocks in the work breakdown structure were filled, we knew we could make it happen, and we did. Uh, this is what one of them looks like. Uh, this is water handling for a, a, a colony on Mars. I'm not going to go into the detail here because I got, I got the word. I got to speed up. Uh, <clears throat> now, the Space uh, Program Directive 1 was signed by President Trump. And basically, a program directive means the president is ordering the agency to do something. And what President Trump ordered us to do is go back to the moon. So here you have Jack Schmidt, the last guy to walk on the moon, giving President Trump a little uh, space suit guy. Uh, Buzz Aldrin behind him, and Buzz doesn't want to go to the moon, he wants to go to Mars. And I'm going to talk about Buzz in a bit, too. And there's Peg Peggy Whitmore, a woman who's spent more time in space than anybody else. 
uh, three missions, 600 uh, days in space. Uh, we're all celebrating that that directive happened. Uh, now, here's the moon, near side, far side, okay? Now, I'm gonna get you guys angry here because I'm gonna take a little more time than you expected. Uh, <laughs> We have never landed anybody or anything on far side, but guess what? China did. And China just did that last month. Now, and here's how they did it. They put a, uh, a relay satellite behind the moon at Lagrange 2, and that's the point where if the moon rotates around the Earth, that point rotates around the Earth with it. So that relay satellite will always be in the same spot. And notice it goes around in a circle. Why? Because from Earth you want to be able to relay. The Chinese put that in orbit, and then <clears throat> they landed, they put down a lander and a rover, and now play the video. You're gonna actually see the landing of the uh, Chang-4, uh, and now you notice the four, watch the horizon slowly compress. This is a two minute video, so tough. But you know, <laughs> two billion people have seen this video. Very few of them are Americans, all right? Now it's gonna come down. You notice your horizon is getting tighter and tighter as he comes down. You start up around 10 miles up. Now the spacecraft is getting close, and then something strange is gonna happen. I'm gonna show you in a second. And that's getting closer and closer. And now look where he's heading. He's heading right to a hill. He lands on that hill that's a little bit dangerous. So what the Chinese controllers did, as they're coming down closer and closer to the hill, they said, uh-uh, we're gonna go somewhere else. <laughs> and they could do that through the relay satellites. If you land on the hill, you may tip over a little bit. And now it's gonna zoom in on this lander. It's not gonna land in a crater here. Uh, here's another hill. Right, uh -oh, he's heading right toward it. Nope, can't do that. That takes three seconds for that signal to get back. That's why there's a little delay. Now he moves slightly off that hill, and you're gonna see that hill in the next picture, by the way. And it's coming down, he's landing, there's dust getting kicked up, and the dust settles, and you're gonna get a tack sharp look at where Chang-4 landed on Luna Far Side. That's worthy of applause. You know? So that's, this is what it looks like. In the background, by the way, you can see the hill that he missed. This is not the one you wanted to land out. And then you send out a rover. And the rover looks like this. It's called U-22. And uh, you can see the tracks it's made. And it's doing exploration right now, taking very good pictures. Go online, uh, Google U-22, and they've made a beautiful panorama of the lunar far side where they landed. Uh, this is a neat achievement. Now, why hasn't America done this? Because we've basically put our space program in hold for the last eight, eight years. Now, we've had remote satellites, but those projects were started uh, in, in the 1980s, uh, and they went to, went to in the 90s, and they went to the outer planets. Uh, we need to get the agency going again. So, how are we gonna do that? This is where NASA should be going. NASA had two choices. That when we went to the moon on Apollo, we took the bottom choice, directly to the moon, and we landed. Very expensive, big rocket. It was Kennedy's achievement, and of course, of the Apollo astronauts. Here's the way this should happen. We, we get way stations in between. There's the International Space Station. We put depots, space tugs, and uh, what we've decided on is the, what's called the Lunar Gateway. And the Lunar Gateway, uh, has space tugs. They never land on Earth. They get taken off into space and they go shuttle back and forth between the moon, 
between the gateway. And by the way, you see Mars here? That's why Buzz Aldrin was in that signing ceremony, because he wants to go to Mars. And he was very happy about it, because this is going to be a gateway to Mars, too. Uh, this is what the gateway looks like. It's going to orbit the moon. A couple of modules stuck together with some solar cells. We're going to be able to put people in there. This is Jim Bridenstine, the new administrator of NASA. Uh, this was taken about two days ago. I like to keep my slide sets current. Uh, uh, talking to industry about how we are going to use the Lunar Gateway, putting it out for bids. We're going to put bids out for space tugs. We're going to put bid out, bids out for landers and uh, rejuvenate the space program. And he wants it done very quickly. He's giving the uh, industry till mid-March to come up with proposals. They're going to evaluate them. They're going to pick them. And then they uh, put together a decent, a decent program. This is what we're looking to see on the moon, rovers, uh, habitats, uh, people being able to walk around. People looking for helium-3, by the way, which you could take back to Earth and incorporate into fusion technology. There's Buzz Aldrin, all right? He's, he's standing in front of uh, Stonehenge. He has this great uh, T-shirt on that says, get your ass to Mars. Well, th this is uh, you know, a typical test pilot language. And, uh, and Buzz, that's what it looks like. And by the way, this is Phobos and this is Deimos. Uh, Phobos is the fast-moving inner moon of Mars. Goes around the planet three times in one day, very fast. Uh, I'm suggesting that we go to Phobos first before we go to Mars. And Phobos, and, and by the way, this is the kind of spacecraft you would need, uh, circling around, getting gravity. Well, they want me out of here. All right. There's defects to this spacecraft. You have windows. We don't, gonna have, you don't need windows. You need a little hole and you need a big TV screen inside, okay? Uh, that's what Mars looks like real fast now, okay? This is Phobos, not a land there. It's a fascinating moon. So, uh, stripes of, you know, geologists would have a field day there. Uh, this is what Mars looks like from Phobos. That's how close it is to the planet. By the way, easy to get back from Phobos. Number one, when you go there, the, planet, the moon's moving so fast, you don't need that much fuel. When you take off to go back to Earth, get off on the other side, and you can save fuel on the way back. So. Anyway, this is the rest of my presentation. Well, you're not going to see. <laughs> All right? However, this slide you should see. Uh, it, going to Mars is not that important, even if I just told you, going to Phobos. Why? It's what we learn, the technology we develop, the same kind of thing we did with Apollo. We're going to spread it all over the world again. It's how we use it. That's how humankind will flourish. And like I say in the end here, spacefaring is a wonderful alternative to war. Thank you, folks. <laughs> Sorry about that. You used the time as you saw fit. OK. Great. Our next speaker is a prolific writer and aerospace entrepreneur. Um, Neil Armstrong served on the board of one of his companies. His name was on the first rocket that took Americans up to the space station with the Russians. His speech, What Makes People Exceptional? Please welcome the Sasakawa International Center for Space Architecture founder at the College of Engineering at the University of Houston, Professor Larry Bell. I think the title of my talk tonight is quite appropriate. I said, what makes people exceptional? I think we've heard a lot about an exceptional person today, and, and uh, that was very interesting to me. Um, pretty remarkable person. I've had the good fortune to know a lot of remarkable people including probably most of the Apollo astronauts and the people that built that program. 
Speaking of which, in fact, I have a book here. Oh, that, that yellow one at the bottom there? I'm pitch hitting tonight. Um, Walt Cunningham, Apollo 7 astronaut, was supposed to speak here tonight. So I got a call from Tom uh, a couple days ago. I said, uh, do you want to go to New Jersey? And I said, it's a lot warmer in Houston. And uh, so Walt couldn't come. Uh, he's a dear friend of mine. We've been friends for many, many years. He had a little, he had an appointment with a doctor and he said, I want you to please tell everybody I really wanted to come. And it was very genuine. I'll confirm that. People in space, uh, in the space program, uh, like to do with, deal with complex stuff. And um, that can get us in a lot of trouble because climate is complex stuff. And so it's very challenging. I know Tom also from the, from the, from the climate camp. Uh, a lot of people that Tom helped organize at the Johnson Space Center are applying their uh, an analyses that, that they developed in their technological um, approaches to problem solving to look at how climate works and how the media doesn't. And uh, so a lot of us became kind of climate junkies as well. Um, I wrote a couple books on climate. One is called Climate of Corruption, The Politics and Power Behind the Global Warming Hoax which gives you a pretty good idea what the book's about. <laughs> and, and it was dedicated to Al Gore. <laughs> and, the, and the dedication said, dedicated to Al Gore, whose invention of the internet made this book possible. <laughs> and whose invention of facts made it necessary. <laughs> I didn't get a publisher right away, because most of them are located in the East Coast and the West Coast. I had to go to, I had to, go to San Antonio, not in Austin, to get, you know, anyway, to get an agent, but anyway. I got in enough trouble on that book that some of my scientific friends said, would I write another book? And uh, I write a lot. I've written, I guess, coming up on 600 articles for Forbes and Newsmax on a lot of different topics. And I guess I'm coming up on nine books. This is in the, just the past few years. The book I'm working on now is being co-edited with someone you just saw, Buzz Aldrin. And it's Beyond Footprints and Flagpoles is the name of the book. And Buzz really wants to go to Mars. He, 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 and, and he thinks we should go one way. He, you know, he, he says, you know, after we go to all the costs of taking people to Mars, why would in the world would we bring them back? And, we, you know, we, you know, and he's serious. Buzz is serious. Buzz is passionate. And Buzz is one of my very closest friends. Has been for 40 years. House guest and friend and buddy. And there's two things he cares about. He cares about space and he cares about his family. And he's, and, and, uh, he's really a remarkable person. I didn't go to see the First Man movie for two reasons. One, because it was the first men, not the first man. And the, and the Apollo program and, and, that, and that landing in particular involved three, three astronauts. Two of them went to the surface, and they got their, this, their butts hit the, hit the ground at the same time. And they took the same risk. And they're both outstanding people, and I knew them both. I know one of them, and I knew the other one. Quite different kind of people, but they're marvelous people. And you think of the history. 
you know, they were jet pilots in, 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 in the Korean War. And Neil nearly got shot down, lost a wing, and Buzz shot down two MiGs. Both of the pilots ejected. He's pleased that that happened. But, uh, he's, you know, Buzz, Buzz uh, graduated second in his class at West Point. You know, he's not a dummy. He got his PhD in MIT in orbital mechanics. Um, these are remarkable people. And, and I look at the astronauts and I look at NASA and I, I know so many of these people. And they're a bunch of grown up Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts. They are so, so straight arrow, you wouldn't believe it. But they're different also. They have different personalities, they have different views, but they have some other important things in common. So I'm really pleased. I was very pleased. I knew nothing about this conference. I'm very pleased to be invited. I'm equally pleased at what I saw today. It was inspiring to me. It was interesting to me. Um, I, the people I meet, you people. I write a lot, and writing is very solitary. I sit in my office and I, and I type with two fingers, and I figure, when, when, when I write a book, it's like 100, 100 pages, I figured out. A 300 page book is 100,000 100, words. And then there's like five letters in a word, and then I miss, I miss every three words. You know, and, and so it's, I figure it's a million. My, my finger was this much longer before I started doing this. And I never learned how to type because when I was in high school, only the dorky guys would take typing because unless you wanted to pick up a girl, and why else would you take typing? And, <laughs> and look at me, do I look like I need to, need to, dig, you know, to go to that level? Come on. So, so, so anyway, I, but, but, but this, this conference has been really an eye opener for me and a mind opener and a, I think a soul opener and I thought the music today was absolutely wonderful and I've never gone to a conference where they had a concert before. Certainly not NASA. <laughs> One, I had cataract surgery a couple of months ago and, and my eyes are really great except I have glasses for close reading and I just broke the lens out of my cheap drugstore glasses so I have one lens in here. So I'm going to see if I can read. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the climate stuff, you know, my, my writing is, I write about a lot of stuff, different stuff and I read, you know, the, the climate stuff's one. NASA does wonderful things. But they do crappy climate science. Really suckle. <laughs> and and they, got this, they got this little, this little office in a Manhattan uh, office building called the Goddard Institute for Space Studies. Now that is a travesty. Goddard is the father of space flight. And they got these people you know, that are, you know, whenever you hear the warmest day in 100 years, you know, all this stuff. It's coming out of the Goddard Institute for Space Studies. And they have the audacity to attribute it to NASA. And it's disgusting. Yep. I agree. And, and so on my first book, which got me in some trouble, but it was good trouble, Walt Cunningham, so I'll share some words with you. He wrote a tribute on the back of my book. This, this goes back in just a few years. If I can read it, it's kind of small. Right? And here's what, but here's, what, here's what Walt said. He said, those of us fortunate enough to have traveled in space bet our lives on the competence, the dedication, and integrity of the science and technology professionals who made our missions possible. In the last 20 years, I have watched high standards of science being violated by a few influential climate scientists, including some at NASA while some special interest opportunities have dangerously abused our public trust. And he goes on to say, this important book shines light on the self-serving agendas, shady political dealings behind the global warming hoax. They, we absolutely must change while there is still time. Science got us to the moon. Science, you know, we didn't always know we were right, but we wouldn't have gone if we didn't think we were right. 
I have uh, links both in the, in, the, in the government side of things, also the commercial side of things. One of the companies I started was with Max Faget, chief engineer at the Johnson Space Center, who started the shuttle program. And then two of the former directors of the Johnson Space Center were on our board, as well as Neil Armstrong and so on. So I've been, in, been involved, in that company grew to over 8,000 people, when the New York Stock Exchange and General Dynamics bought us. So I, I believe in commercialization of space. I believe that there's, I believe that there's opportunities. I, I'm excited that I, we see what Musk is doing. I don't like all his dealings with Tesla and our, our tax subsidized cars that we're doing for him and, the, and, and, and Solar City and some of this other stuff. But they are making progress and I think it's great, you know, when we see now Bezos and others who are, I think, making progress and I think we're gonna see the cost of entry to space greatly improved, uh, which will make, make everything much more economically reasonable with the commercial sector now really being involved. Right now, I think it's mostly NASA's outs outsourcing of work rather than really going there for the, you know, for the gold. But hopefully that will come. But certainly the satellite business came out of the space program and your GPS and everything else that came out of that of course, is attributable to, to the space program. Uh, can you run on here? I want to pick up on a comment that was made earlier today, and this is out of sequence in the comment, but it was a discussion of pessimism. And that, that word, I think, is, is such an important one is this conference, and I think in our country, but I would like to add, I was, you know, my comment is that pessimism has been weaponized by identity politics. And, and it's a notion, I know, I, you know what, what we've heard from LaRouche and others that we should look forward and then pick, pick, a, pick a tall flagpole to, 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 to direct our, our planning to beyond our children, perhaps beyond their children, and guide ourselves by that longer, by that, by that long flag. Uh, that, I think that, that uh, the notion that we can do things, we, that we believe that we can accomplish things is just absolutely terribly important. I, look, I looked at, I wrote a book, uh, thinking, thinking Whole on what it is that makes people really exceptional, which is the topic of my, my talk, and I, I'm, I'm gonna have to cut this short. I find that there's, you know, in the book, and I look at personal friends of mine, Jane Goodall is a good friend, and she went to Africa and tried to find out what we can learn from chimpanzees that made us more human, and found out, that, no, no, they kill each other and bite each other's faces off. So, 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 I mean, there's, you know, there's, you know, we, we, we got to depend on ourselves rather than chimpanzees, you know. Uh, but, and chimpanzees are cute. I have nothing against chimpanzees. I broke it down into five categories of things that, that you know, things that people care about. And one is, one is that they're, they're observers. They care enough about their, their world and what's going around that they observe things that are going on around them. I think creativity is an analog activity. You see something here that you notice, that you're noticing more things, and you apply it to something over here, and somebody else says, yeah, but that was purple, and this was red, and you say, yeah, but, but they walk differently. You know, I mean, it's the ability to observe things, and we all observe different things from our own perspective and from our own background, but, but being tuned into what's around you is so important, politically and, and, and naturally and everything else. The other thing they really, that I think defines people that makes them incredibly important, you know, successful, it doesn't always end well for them, but, but, but we learn from them, is they have the capacity to care about something. They really, really care, which is why it makes them persistent. The reason they keep getting up and they keep doing things, because they really want, they really care. I broke this into five categories, and I thought of looking for my friends and people in history and so on. One category is the humanitarians. Humanitarians are very empathetic. They, they're people people. 
And you see them hospice workers and doctors and teachers and, and, and people who, who really put themselves out there and connect with other people. And, and God, they're, God they're, any of us that have been to the hospital a few times know, know, know what, what that means. Second category I put are the visualists. We saw some of them today playing, playing music for us and so on. I don't call them artists because people think art is something you hang on a wall. It's, it's the visionary, it's the visualist, it's the ones that have the vision of the music and the vision of the beauty and vision of humanity and so on. That, that you know, they're sculptors, they're architects, they're people who, who have a vision you can't really quantify, but you feel it. The third category I have are the scientists. And the scientists want to solve how does quantum theory work? You know, you know it just violates New Newtonian physics. How can it work? But it works. And now we have quantum computing right now that shows that it works. And it's, I wrote a book on another book. One of the books on there is, is uh, reinventing ourselves, how information technology is rapidly and radically transforming humanity. And some of it's real scary. We can Skype now with grandma. And we can, you know, we can do these things. And, and my analogy is it's, it's the boiling frog analogy. The frog is in, in water, and we're, we're submersed in water, and it's technology around us. We have social media, we have all, you know, we have all, all these other things. And, 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 our, and our, our bodies, you know, we're, we're adjusting to the temperature, the waters keep increasing. They say, well, you know, we'll give you more security with security cameras everywhere, and never mind that Siri's listening to you and so on. Oh, I forgot, she's. Um, <laughs> never, never, never mind this. Uh, just give us a little more of your privacy, and we'll give you more security, we'll give you more convenience, and pretty soon you can't jump out of the pan, and, and you boil. And I think that's, you know, there's a chance where we're heading. So when I wrote the book, I thought, is this my worst na nightmare or my exciting dream? You know, technology, I can now, I can telecommute to work. I don't have to drive to work, I can, I can, I can do stuff. We have a choice. We can look at space and we can say, okay, where did the space program come from? It came from buzz bombs flying out of Germany being built at Pia Monday. They were raining down on London. We had Apollo Soyuz, which was, you know, let's, can't we all get along during, during, detente, during, during the Cold War? Can't we all get along? The Earth, we're looking now at the Earth from space and it's, 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 it's very fragile and, you know, the, the atmosphere of the Earth is like, like the skin of a grapefruit thick compared to, the, compared to the Earth. So can't we get along? Can't we go to Mars together? Can't we, you know, can't, can't we be part of this larger humanity? My center, I have students from all over the world. I've got from Siberia, I've got India and so on. They come in the program for a year and a half. We look at every aspect of space, mission planning, trajectory, spacecraft design. You think of space as being specialized, a lot of stuff. We worry about radiation issues, cosmic radiation, solar energy particles. Uh, how, do you, how do you land something? How do you move it? How do you connect things together? Uh, how does, how does, what happens when your muscles and bones demineralize because of low gravity and, and all that kind of stuff? That's what we do. And I ask my students, because they, they come here they're all over the world, you know, why would you give up a year and a half of your life? To, to, to do this, you, you must think there's a future. And I'm going to just be real quick here. Uh, and I'm going to pick up on, on, on what, what Tom said. Why do we go to space? I've, I've tried to, and there's so many other priorities. Why do we go to space? One is I think we do it because we want to, because it inspires dreams and it inspires exceptional achievements is something that lifts us, draws us, expands us. We do it to expand advanced technology, science, global culture, the things that Tom was talking about. We go there to motivate learning, to get young people thinking about something that maybe that they can apply. Maybe they'll actually learn something about physics and sciences and so on. Global warming maybe even, if we're really lucky. We go there to, to transfer lessons, as Tom was saying, about how we do things so we can keep the planet from becoming an extreme environment. And we go to space because it's our destiny to do so. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bell. Our next speaker is going to be speaking on LaRouche's strategic defense of Earth, building on one of LaRouche's great victories, the adoption by Ronald Reagan of the Strategic Defense Initiative in 1983. Please welcome my colleague on the LaRouche Pack scientific research team, Ben Denniston. All right, very glad to be here. Glad everyone stuck with us to the end of this uh, very fun and fascinating discussion. I'm going to try and trim it a little bit short, so um, bear with me if it jumps around just a little bit. Uh, but as Jason mentioned, I'm going to discuss mankind's future in space, but from a slightly different perspective. From the standpoint of the strategic defense of Earth, from the threats and challenges posed really to all mankind by the very nature of our existence in this solar system and in our galaxy beyond. We're going to look at the threats from asteroid and comet impacts with the Earth to the dangers of solar flares and electromagnetic pulses to the challenges, the real challenges of climate change, which are the natural climate variations that mankind has to deal with. And when we take all of these together, it becomes very clear that in reality, if we really scientifically look at our position in the universe, given the state of mankind today, we are incredibly vulnerable on this small planet of ours. So we tend to think of ourselves as living on Earth. Most people, I think, do. I think we have a fine selection of people here with a little bit of a broader perspective. But I think the average person on the planet and the average cultural experience of most people is thinking about earthly origins and earthly destinies. And I think we're at the point where we're realizing that mentality is no longer going to cut it. We live in our solar system and we live in our galaxy. And mankind has a choice. We can rise to that level, become a species of the solar system, become an inhabitant of the galaxy, or we can most likely ensure our own extinction if we don't rise to that challenge. So the strategic defense of Earth is a particular phrase that was named in direct reference to the Strategic Defense Initiative, the SDI, Mr. LaRouche's program. So if we truly want to understand the SDE and what, what Mr. LaRouche saw in the SDE and the importance of this policy, we really have to look to his original conception of the SDI. And I think this question summarizes the policy in a broader perspective. What is the scientific basis of a sustainable peace among the leading powers of the planet? Um, I had a little bit more to say, but I wanted to reference um, I was very happy Helga actually directed me to this document by Mr. LaRouche from 1984 as insights into his broadest conception of what the SDI policy was really about. Uh, it's the LaRouche Doctrine draft memorandum between the United States of America and the USSR. And in here he discusses his strategic policy, the SDI. Um, but this article is composed, this uh, memorandum is composed of seven articles. It's not until literally the fifth article over halfway through the document that Mr. LaRouche actually mentions anything about military policy or about the beam defense policy, which was his conception of the strategic defense initiative. Skip over a couple of things here. The opening, very opening of article one, um, Mr. LaRouche says, the political foundation for a durable peace, and, and I skipped over, but I just mentioned, this is again coming up today, uh, missile defense, strategic defense, you know, the Trump administration, there's people looking at these issues. It's clear that we still, as has been said in this conference, and as many people realize, we still 
sit in a very dangerous situation where we're not that far from the outbreak of nu nuclear war, which is, you know, you're still looking at the potential annihilation of civilization. That threat is still real. So this whole SDI, SDE discussion has still incredible strategic importance. So to get to Mr. LaRouche's insights into this question, what is the basis of a sustainable peace among the leading powers of the world? He opens his document as follows. The political foundation for a durable peace must be A, the unconditional sovereignty of each and all nation states, and B, cooperation among sovereign nation states to the effect of promoting unlimited opportunities to participate in the benefits of technological progress to the mutual benefit of each and all. The genius of Mr. LaRouche's program, and I just recommend people read this document in its entirety, it's not very long. The genius of Mr. LaRouche's SDI was really the science driver characteristic. The directed energy systems, as you see depicted here, uh, the Technological capabilities to defeat nuclear missiles required major technological breakthroughs. And if those technologies were implemented in the civilian economies, in the US, the Soviet Union, and other nations, they could generate massive increases in the productive powers of labor, major increases in the potential relative population density of all economies involved. And combining this science driver program with a technology transfer program to the formerly colonized world, allowing so-called third world nations to become modern, industrialized, and productive economies participating in these advanced technologies. LaRouche knew this was the only true scientific and lasting basis for peace. The specifics of the directed energy technologies for missile defense were really just a subsumed element of the true policy and while the full realization of these policies, as Mr. Lewis outlined in this very document, demanded the continuation of the most advanced science driver policies, which required mankind's conquest of space. As Mr. LaRouche said towards the conclusion of the LaRouche Doctrine, the powers jointly agree upon the adoption of two tasks as the common interest of mankind, as well as the specific interest of each of the two powers. One, the establishment of full economic equity respecting the conditions of individual life in all nations on this planet during a period of not more than 50 years. And two, man's exploration and colonization of nearby space Oops. As, the as the continuing common objective and interest of mankind during and beyond the completion of the first task. The adoption of these two working goals as the common tasks and respective interests in common of the two powers and of other co cooperating nations constitutes the central point of reference for erosion of the, poten of the potential political and economic causes of warfare between the powers. So, at the heart, at the most fundamental underlying principles, uh, these remain just as valid today as they were when LaRouche authored this document 35 years ago. Now I'm going to skip over this a little bit quickly, but there's a fascinating history really coming right out of the fall of the Soviet Union where many of the people involved in the SDI and similar efforts gathered directly around the idea of asteroid defense because that was just at the time in the 90s when this was, there was a growing recognition that this threat was real and had to be dealt with. Um, there's a whole history of U.S.-Russian cooperation pushes to make this a major basis to move towards a positive era of relations in the spirit of the SDI. And therefore, it was no coincidence that even later in 2011, the Russians re-raise this offer of the strategic defense of Earth. That's actually where that phrase came from. When an offer was put to the United States to cooperate with the Russians on not just a joint missile defense program, but a program to defend the whole planet from the very real threat of asteroid and common impacts. And this was posed explicitly as an alternative to the 
insane policy of NATO's eastward expansion, which was really raising the threshold of tensions and threatening the outbreak of war again. So here we are today, again a few years later, and my perspective is, and my work with Mr. LaRouche on this issue has been to look at the issue of the strategic defense of Earth, this SDE policy, really from the broadest possible perspective. And this defines a complete coherence between Mr. LaRouche's SDI program of joint strategic cooperation and defense and Mr. LaRouche's deeper insights into the necessity, and we've gotten a taste of that, I think, from our prior presentations, a very good discussion on this, the absolute necessity of space development and ultimately space colonization. So the threat of asteroid and comet impacts is still very real and has not been addressed. Um, but it turns out this, even this issue is really just the tip of the iceberg as mankind is slowly realizing there are many existential threats just to the nature of our existence in the solar system. From extreme solar activity, climate change, and even frontier questions about our relation to our galaxy. So starting with the issue of asteroids, it's notable there has been some success in detecting and tracking some of the largest asteroids. However, the reality is we've barely scratched the surface on even this first aspect of the challenge. And I'm sure people saw plenty of footage of this years ago. Uh, this was a completely unexpected surprise explosion of a relatively small asteroid over Chelyabinsk, Russia in 2013. And this just serves to demonstrate we still don't know where the vast majority of these asteroids are. While we've tracked many of the larger ones, especially for the smaller or medium-sized objects, and we're talking about objects that could take out an entire city, take out an entire metropolitan area, take out an entire country, potentially. For objects of these small to medium size range, it's estimated there are literally hundreds of thousands estimated out there that we know nothing about that we haven't found yet, that we're not tracking, that we wouldn't know if they're on an impact trajectory a few years from now. And this was constantly demonstrated, it was demonstrated just again, just a few weeks ago, on February 4th, this month, NASA detected a brand new asteroid, didn't know it existed, and by the time they detected it, it was only literally seven days from a close pass right by the Earth. If that was on an impact trajectory, we would have had nothing we could have done about that. This is a map of some of the, again, relatively smaller bodies, but these are explosions in the upper atmosphere from small asteroids over a couple decades. And then on, some of these are the size of small nuclear explosions. Just to show you, this is a regular occurrence. So the point is we have absolutely no defense for this threat currently and it's time that the United States, Russia, China, other leading nations take this threat seriously and create the capabilities to defend the Earth from these threats. But as I said, asteroids, that's really just the beginning. That's not the full issue. That's just kind of the first easier aspect of the challenge, quite frankly. We have a more difficult situation when you go to the issue of comets, which are different than asteroids, largely by their orbital characteristics, because these comets, first of all, tend to be significantly larger than asteroids, and are literally pretty much impossible to detect with our current systems, because for the majority of their lifetime, they reside out in the farthest reaches of the solar system. So what that means is that a major comet could literally be five or ten years away from an impact with the Earth, and we would have absolutely no idea. As an example of this, in January 1996, scientists discovered a new comet, named it C1996b2, originating way out in the depths of the solar system. By the time they discovered this comet, it was two months away from a 
relatively close pass by the Earth. Again, if this had been on an impact trajectory, two months, absolutely no time, and an object of this size, you're really talking about the borderline of an extinction level event for an impact. So that's just another case study. Um, if we want to step away from the issues of asteroids and comets, it's really only relatively recently that scientists have begun to really grasp and study and understand the ch dangers posed by large explosions of solar activity. Large solar flares and the releases of plasma that can be shot at the Earth and can generate electromagnetic pulses here on Earth. For example, in 1859, this happened. The Earth was struck by a massive uh, outburst of solar activity. If people have heard of this, this case, it's rather fascinating. There were auroras generated all the way down to Florida, further south than Florida into the Caribbean. Um, there was cases of people being able to read books at night by the aurora light because the activity was so intense. And there were cases of telegraph operators, telegra telegraph lines were relatively new, telegraph operators actually receiving electrical shocks from the electrical surges that were induced into their telegraph lines. So this was later named the Carrington event. And today it's now recognized that a similar event of this size, if it were to happen with our current level of electrical infrastructure, uh, could cause uh, massive blackouts. Um, it's been estimated by various scientists, NASA, other places, um, that if an event were like this were to happen today, you could literally have dozens of major metropolitan areas, major cities, without power for months because of the devastation this could cause to our electrical infrastructure. And really, Solar flares, coronal mass ejections of this size are really not all that infrequent. Um, in 2012, it's now been shown that uh, solar ejection capable of causing this level of destruction was released and missed the Earth by merely a couple weeks. If it had been released a couple weeks prior or after, it would have impacted the Earth, so a relatively very close pass. The vast majority, everybody was basically completely ignorant of the implications when it happened. And even today, the vast majority of people don't even know that we had such a close brush with a potentially humanitarian crisis. Now these singular explosive events from the sun, that kind of represents one end of the challenge when you're dealing with solar activity. But we also have a lot to learn about the slower and more gradual changes occurring over the course of decades, centuries. And it's the fact that some of the most significant climate change in relatively modern history has corresponded directly with periods of very weak solar activity. I'm sure a number of people are familiar with the so-called Little Ice Age in the latter half of the 1600s, corresponding with what was called the Maunder Minimum a period of extremely low solar activity. So regional global cooling on this scale can have major consequences for agricultural production, for quality of life, for various things. And there are today a few independent scientific teams out there that are trying to study the sun, trying to understand it, and some people believe that there are signs that the sun could be heading into a similar period of weakening during this coming century, the present century. So we have to better understand our own sun and really understand how stars operate in general, looking at other stars like ours, expand our scientific knowledge, better know what our own star is capable of and what we can do to respond to it. And from here, we we'll probably briefly just touch on a much, even a grander scale perspective looking at the changing relation of our solar system to our galaxy. These are frontier areas of science that are fascinating. Um, these are very slow changes over the courses of millions of years. 
but we have evidence that somehow, potentially, even the evolutionary development of life on Earth, the evolutionary process that brought life to its present state of conditions on Earth over tens, hundreds of millions of years, somehow reflects some causal relationship with our relation to our galaxy. And these galactic relations are associated with really entirely new questions about the fundamental understanding of science, encompassing all kinds of mysteries ranging from questions about the fundamental nature of gravity associated with what some people call so-called dark matter to complete astronomical enigmas known as supermassive black holes and all kinds of mysteries about the or organization and dynamics of galactic systems as a whole. And really we stand at the brink of completely new eras of science defined by these higher level questions of physics associated with galactic systems. So that covers quite a diverse array of subjects encompassed by the question of the strategic defense of Earth. The threat of asteroid and comet impacts, electromagnetic pulses from solar activity, actual climate change from the sun and other causes, deep questions about the effect our galaxy has on life on Earth and other processes here on Earth. This might sound like kind of a scattered array of different subjects, but it's clear there's really one unifying principle underlying all of this, which is the future existence of mankind requires eliminating the conception that we're simply of an earthly existence. And mankind's destiny requires rising to the level of being a species of the solar system and a species of the galaxy beyond. And this brings us back to Lyndon LaRouche's principle, the true basis for a sustainable peace. The idea of the SDE is that leading nations must bring together the greatest scientific and technological capabilities in pursuit of revolutionary new technological breakthroughs that will give mankind the capabilities to handle all of these threats. And these technologies must be not hidden away in military domains, but they must be made freely available for the application throughout economies worldwide. And we should really be thinking about the kind of complete revolutions in mankind's relation to the solar system and what technologies would be required for that. So things like designs for vacuum tube magnetic levitation space launch systems. These can lower the cost of putting payloads into orbit by two orders of magnitude, completely revolutionizing mankind's access to space. So if we want to be a spacefaring species, we need to look at revolutionary ways of having much more uh, rapid and large-scale access to space. Um, as was discussed earlier, fusion propulsion technologies allowing continually powered flight throughout the solar system, completely moving away from these incredibly slow orbital trajectories, and really opening up the entire solar system to rapid and dynamic access by mankind. The capabilities required to mine, process, and even manufacture resources directly from the material on other planetary bodies. And as was mentioned earlier, perhaps one of the most intriguing initial examples being the unique potential to mine helium-3 from the moon as a fusion fuel, uh, as one of the best fusion fuels available. And as was also discussed, the space infrastructure needed to really support manned outposts on the moon and eventually Mars, just as Mr. LaRouche outlined in his 1980s proposal for a moon-Mars colonization program. So these are the types of crash programs that are really required for a true strategic defense of Earth. We have to give mankind an entirely new platform of economic potential and activity throughout the solar system, allowing us to handle these types of threats discussed earlier, while at the same time 
forcing the required rapid rates of technological breakthroughs, which are needed to ensure, as Mr. LaRouche brilliantly called for, cooperation among sovereign nation states to the effect of promoting unlimited opportunities to participate in the benefits of technological progress to the mutual benefit of each and all, as Mr. LaRouche defined as really the absolutely necess necessary precondition for peace. This really takes, uh, takes the idea of Russian-U.S. cooperation against terrorism up to a new level, huh? That's right. Taking out the asteroids. So our uh, next speaker is actually earlier on the program. Hal Cooper, who was unable to speak during the first panel, is going to offer us a vision about the infrastructure needs of rail, energy, and water for the full economic development of Africa. Dr. Cooper has been a civil engineer for many years, and he has collaborated closely with the LaRouche movement over decades in working out the details on the proposals for many of the maps and other imagery that you will see in our reports on the Silk Road on the World Land Bridge. He has a long history of cooperation and work with African nations. He is met with members of the African Union and discussed in detail how rail in particular and other transportation networks ought best to be arranged in Africa. So we're very honored to be able to have his input today on this topic. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm very happy to uh, be here. I'm sorry I was... Uh, Somewhat delayed today. I had some. Is this better? Yeah. Okay, good. Now, if I hold it, then it's even better, right? <laughs> good. I'm going to be speaking tonight on rail infrastructure development in Africa. And I'm going to finish up afterwards by talking about a, one of the provisions was in the uh, Green New Deal. And it has to, to be the subject of a national high-speed rail system, which I will discuss after I finish the presentation on Africa. The first view graph, please. It's up there. Uh, go to the next one. Africa. It's a big continent, up to 3,000 miles wide and 5,000 miles long parallel to South America. And those are the two continents of the world that have had the least economic development to date. And we're talking about what do we need to do to help Africa in the present and especially in the future. Uh, this is a, a diagram of what might be a full-scale rail infrastructure program development, which is actually based upon earlier work by the LaRouche organization going back to the 1980s. Next slide. Southern Africa. I was asked uh, several years ago by one of the LaRouche members, Thomas Fuller, from Tacoma, Washington, to do a feasibility study of what could we do to develop a rail network in Southern Africa, uh, particularly focusing around the Democratic Republic of the Congo, expanding to South Africa and all the countries in between, both on the east and the west sides of Africa. Next slide. Africa has an enormous potential for energy development in parallel to rail development and water development in certain areas. However, there is a large maldistribution of particularly the water. And this is where hydroelectric power facilities could be located along rivers. The Congo River is most important followed by the Nile, followed by the Niger, and then the Orange River in South Africa. Next slide. Excellent. This is the river basin a, a diagram of Africa. 
And again, you have the Congo, which has the largest water flow, the Nile, and a number of other rivers in there, the Niger, Niger River, the Orange, and numerous others in Africa. Most importantly, the Congo, because it's the second largest river flow in the world next to the Amazon. And it's in the same tropical region, of course, where the maximum uh, water uh, potential is available. Next slide. The one country in Africa, which is to date, had a major economic development of railroads, goes back to the early in the 20th century and actually into the late 19th century in South Africa. And the South African Railways was the one that has been the most developed in the world. It actually is primarily a narrow gauge railroad with a s smaller gauge than, than we have in the United States. It's about three feet six inches versus four feet eight and a half inches. And then in Russia, of course, you have the five-foot uh, Russian gauge. Uh, if we're going to have a successful system, it's all got to be the same in Africa, ultimately. And we'll discuss in a minute what the rest of them are. Next slide. Um, I believe there's been some discussion today about the Trans Aqua Project in Africa which would take water from the Congo River and put it into Lake Chad in North Central Africa, which is in the sub-Saharan region, just at the southern end of the Sahara Desert. And refilling this lake, which has been slowly evaporating, and of course the, uh, the, the country of Chad and the neighbors around it have been forced to adopt the British policy of no interbasin transfer of water, which basically means they're eventually going to run out, which is exactly what's been happening. Now this policy, this change completely eliminates that policy because the Congo River has far more than enough water to supply them and it could be very helpful to the countries to the north without uh, a detrimental effect on the Congo River. It's, it's a huge river. Next slide. Now, the, the Transaqua project involved actually building a canal or series of canals from the Congo River up to Lake Chad and refilling it. Now, Lake Chad would, it would, it would be a basin that actually doesn't have an outflow. It, it only has inflows. But it would be the center of a major agricultural region and other industrial developments as well. And it would benefit Nigeria and several other countries uh, plus Chad. Next slide, please. Now, the clear blue section of, of Lake Chad is the part that has water today. The part that is shaded and has other blue uh, increments in it is actually what was evaporated or gone away because of the lowering of the lake with a flow. And that needs to be corrected by bringing water in from the south from the Congo River Basin. Next slide. And here's another picture of the same thing, particularly what could be done to foster economic development around the lake, and that means railroad development plus roads and plus industries and agriculture for the entire region for the benefit of all of them. And then this is an area right now that in the, particularly in, in Nigeria in the north where you have a lot of terrorism activities from from certain Muslim extremists, just like you have in some places in the Middle East. Well, if all of this became prosperous, there'd be no need for the terrorism. Next slide. Um, that's 90 degrees out of phase, but I'll just explain it very briefly. This is where there, there would be two canal systems, one coming uh, from the western part of the, of the Congo River and another more to the east. Next slide. And here's a final uh, view of, of the uh, Lake Chad coming from south from the Central African Republic and the Democratic Republic of the Congo up through uh, in, in, into Chad and in Nigeria, where the lake is now and what it could be in the future. Next slide. Now, there have been some talks of having what was the equivalent of the North American Water and Power Alliance is the African Water and Power Alliance, which is actually a comprehensive water distribution network throughout Africa, uh, a large part of it, bringing water from the Congo River into the Niger River, into the, uh, into the 
Niger River and also into the rivers in South Africa and, and in the southern part of the entire uh, continent of Africa. Next slide. And then if you're going to be building water, you've got to have a transmission system for electricity. Now, right now, probably 70% of the entire electric generation of, of the entire African continent is in South Africa, and it's primarily through 44 coal-fired power plants. Well, uh, they have plenty of coal in, that, in Africa, and they'll, in South Africa, and they'll continue to use it, but you have to have other supply sources, hydroelectric power being one, and one that's particularly applicable, of course, is, is nuclear energy, and then, of course, because of the intense sun near the equator, uh, solar energy in the desert areas in particular in the Sahara. Next slide. And here's another view of the electric transmission network of what could be proposed. And in, in a paper, a detailed paper that I've written, um, this, this is all information available. Next slide. Electric generating capacity. It's presently around 130,000. The idea would bring it up to close to 400,000. And as you can see, South Africa and the eastern part of Africa, the rest of Africa, would be uh, very much a factor. And the Democratic Republic of the Congo would be the largest single generator, primarily because of the dams on the, on the Congo River, and especially the existing Inga Dam, which at 3,000 megawatts right now, could be expanded to as much as 50,000 megawatts. Next slide. And that's another view of the electric generator. I'm sorry that that isn't, isn't a very clear outcome. Move to the next slide. And electric generation in the Congo, which is primarily hydro, there could be a small amount of coal in the east, which actually serves the metal smelting regions because that actually is, is actually part of the ingenical part of the uh, mining process. Next slide. And I list in some detail where and what type of, of, of power generation facilities would be listed for the various places for 2010 and for 2030 and 2050. Next slide. And uh, rail development in the different countries of Africa, what it is now, and also uh, what could be in the future. Next slide. And here's what it is today, what it was in 1990. Next slide what it would be much more comprehensive. Okay, next slide. And here's what a major network would be. And the, here's where the main corridors are. Next slide. And the same thing, next slide. And that's, you'd have parallel tracks for passengers and freight, ultimately electric to the extent possible. There is considerable electrification of railroads in South Africa, but nowhere else in Africa. Next slide. And that's a, a rail development in, in the Sudan region, as well as uh, to the north in, in uh, uh, Egypt and, and so forth. Next slide. And then here's a, a cross corridor for east to west in Africa from, from Point and Ware in the, African, uh, in the, in the uh, Congo Republic all the way over to Tanzania and Kenya. Next slide. And here is what a bridge across the Congo River between Kinshasa, the capital of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and Brazzaville, the capital of the Congo Republic, which is about two and a half or three miles long. Next slide. And it would be a road and rail and telecommunication, electric transmission bridge, all those, and, and pedestrians as well. And that's been proposed, but unfortunately never built. Next slide. And that's what its configuration would look like. So you'd see where the, each of the modes of the transportation would be. Next slide. And Sudan, and then the connection across the Strait of Bab el Mandan between Djibouti and Yemen in the southwestern part. It sure sounds like a better alternative than, than, than the war in Yemen, doesn't it? Next slide. And there's another view of the same picture. Uh, Sudan and South Sudan, uh, getting them at peace, and then getting the uh, rail systems built and the economic development across the Strait of Bab and through the Arabian Peninsula is necessary, including across to the Persian Gulf. Next slide. And there is a picture of a crossing of the Nile River in the northern part of Sudan, uh, which would have a north-south railway across and then a rail line across the bridge, which would be about a mile and a half wide. Next slide. 
And this is across Africa quarter from east to west, which is about 3,000 miles. There actually has been a proposal made by the Chinese to those countries, but as far as I know, there's only some initial studies have been done. Nothing else. Go ahead. Next slide. And then here's what the total cost would be, about $1.5 trillion for the entire project. And with that, I'm done. <laughs> Now, we're done with Africa, but we're not done with the green program for the uh, uh, that has just been made by the Democratic Green New Deal program. And I want to just discuss that very briefly. No slides, there's no more. But there's been some discussion today at this meeting about that program. It sounds like a no growth policy, and it sounds like an anti-technology program, and that's exactly what it is, with one exception, a national high-speed rail network. And I think that's something that this organization needs to promote as the one positive element of the Green New Deal that puts green in the right perspective rather than the wrong one. And with that, I thank you. Wonderful. Well, with that, we will be able to um, take questions. Our time is somewhat limited, so please keep your questions uh, as relevant to the topics discussed as possible and brief. And we're going to be ending a little bit before 10 to make some final announcements, and Lyndon LaRouche will have the last word at this conference via video. All right, hi, uh, my name's Ian, I'm from uh, Maryland. Uh, my question is about um, potential future of um, exploration on the moon, Mars, and possibly further to Europa, Ganymede, and possibly even Phobos. What, is, what would be the future after, say, the Mars rovers, after the Chang'e 4 and the U-22, and what are the potential futures for exploration of Europa? As I see it, we're looking at a, at a phased program. We would go to the moon, in my view, in order to develop the, test the technologies that would be using to go to Mars. Uh, this has to do with te testing ways of set, establishing habitats. But I think in particularly, particular, the, the big mother load at the moon and Mars will be water. And the reason we'll be looking for water is really for fuel so we can reduce the amount of rocket fuel we have to you know, bring with us. So I think, the, 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 as I imagine it, we'll be going to the moon to test, because, because it's so much more difficult to go to Mars. It's a lot further away from the hardware store, something breaks. You, know, you, don't, have, you don't have the windows to get back when, when, when something goes wrong, and so you have to be absolutely certain that things will be reliable. I think some of the biggest issues we face has to do with, and the least understood is radiation, uh, particularly, and I think cosmic radiation in particular because it's very hard to, hard to shield against, but also solar, you know, solar radiation. So we'll be looking at ways of providing shielding. We're gonna be interested in knowing how long people can, can work f effectively in partial gravity on the moon, it's one sixth the Earth gravity. On, on Mars, it's, it's about forty percent. So, so we need to look at the you know biological issues. We'll be looking at whether we can grow food and how much nutritional value we can get from doing that. But as I see it, we'll go to the moon. We'll, we, we'll be testing the technologies, and then in parallel, we'll be moving to Mars. It won't be one and then the other. I, the hope is that this time it won't be foot, footprints and flagpoles, that we will establish infrastructures there where we can uh, reduce the amount, particularly the amount of backpacking we can, we can, we can uh, produce. As, we're, we're looking now at 3D printing. I'm a little skeptical whether it'll be printing structures with 3D printing, but, but we'll be, I think, increasingly producing, you know, creating a lot of our equipment. I think one of the big opportunities for technology is really in the area first of tools to fix things, then of parts that have 
motors and gears inside of them and pumps. And understand that the things we, we put on the moon or Mars, we can't, ex we can't really exchange them. So we have to have a new, whole new paradigm of thinking now where the things we can build, we can augment later. But we're, we're augmenting with things we haven't been in, even been invented yet. So, it, so this is where I think the LaRouche idea, where you have to look forward beyond you know, where we're going to be going, what are we going to be doing, how are, the, how are the systems and technologies we're using for the moon going to be applied to Mars, or actually I'd reverse engineer it. If we go to Mars, what do we need to test on the moon to be certain that we can, we can do that? Thank you. Hi, my name is Faz. I'm from Michigan. I just want to add a little a bit to the last. I skipped through a number of slides that you saw toward the end, right? Uh, and they dealt with development on, on Mars and things like that. One thing I want to bring out, the uh, far side landing by China was a spectacular achievement. There was, Larry and I know the complexity of the work breakdown structure that you need to make that happen. And the fact is, thousands of things could have gone wrong, but none did, okay? Here's the positive here. We have two countries who had advanced space programs who now can start thinking about working together and combining that knowledge and have us acting as a planet as opposed to a nation when we explore the rest of the universe. And the technology sharing, we've actually put a stop to it because of technological theft and things like that. However, China has made its mind to share a lot of what they have achieved. Like I say, go to the internet, you're gonna find a lot more. We didn't do that, but China is. I think that what, what is, this is like a, a negative shot across the bow. China is saying, hey, we're gonna share technology. Why don't we start working together? We're already doing it with the Russians. So I'm very optimistic about that, that, that future for humankind. Okay. Please. Okay. Hi, I'm Faz from, from Michigan. Uh, interestingly, I've got a seven-year-old uh, and we've actually been to Mars and to Europa in our bedtime stories. <laughs> so, and he's uh, designing a, a probe to go into Jupiter's um, atmosphere and figure out what's there. So we just make this stuff up, clearly. All right. But, um, so, my question is uh, about terraforming Mars. Is it possible to rebuild the magnetosphere of Mars and have it uh, rebuild its atmosphere? Oh, go ahead. You want to do it? Go ahead. Uh, you can answer in a second here. Um, well, I, I wanted to, to, to answer that by thinking about, first of all, what is it possible to do this? Well, we're going to find that out as we explore more and actually the full development of our moon, because we will learn a lot from the discoveries and development of actual permanent settlements on the moon and developing the whole of cislunar of space. And because I think this is key and it also answers the question previous. I mean, one of the exciting things, and uh, Tom just brought this up about what China's doing, is it wasn't just a get one-time mission to get the Chang'e 4 to the far side of the moon. The importance of that is that it was a first. It was an achievement that had never been done before. But the Chinese don't expect to stop there. Uh, as a matter of fact, they just laid out their long-term proposal for uh, almost six additional missions going to Chang'e 5 for lunar sampling, and uh, on the near side, Chang'e 6, uh, which will continue to look at the south pole of the moon, Chang'e 7, and eight, uh, particularly, will start to advance our understanding of the lunar soils and what's there and our capabilities for building permanent lunar bases and settlements. And 
The importance of this is you look at what the United States is saying right now, uh, which I find interesting that we just set out a proposal, proposal to uh, get to the moon again by 2028, but the long-term vision for an economic driver is not there. Uh, so the key is, I think we can accomplish what you're saying. Yes, that's the idea that we can actually discover new means of uh, life on Mars uh, in terms of advancing the magnetosphere and so forth, but we have to do this in terms of uh, scientific economic phases that's going to build up the whole of the solar system. So that's, I just wanted to answer. One, one more thing I wanted to add on. Should we use sure. fusion power, to, I mean fusion rockets, to get to Mars as a different and faster way? And then fusion power, obviously, for powering something like an artificial magnetosphere that you can put an orbit around. So I mean, things that, are, that we don't have today, capabilities that we don't have today that can, I mean, these rockets that Musk and Bezos and so forth, are, I mean, these are the same things that we've had for 60, 70 years. With the chemical propulsion yeah, and so exactly. forth. Well, I mean, yeah, because the, the thing is, is that as Mr. LaRouche has continued to emphasize, you have to go with the energy flux density, uh, high energy density drivers of uh, fusion and propulsion, which is not, think about it, I disagree. We don't want to actually send human, as, uh, it's something, as someone stated earlier, uh, Mr. Aldrin, respect to him and everything, all of his accomplishments, but uh, the idea is not to send humans to Mars on a one-way mission that's gonna take nine months, two years, or so forth, and we don't even know if they're gonna get there, if they're gonna be a puddle of muddy, putty, whatever you call it, or if they're actually going to be able to be productive on Mars and be able to bring back to planet Earth. So the idea is we do have to go with higher energy densities of fusion propulsion and to advance uh, 1G acceleration to get people quicker to uh, Mars in a short period of time and be able to return them safely. Uh, we want to get them to Mars and be able to return them safely to Earth and collaborate back and forth. So I'll, uh, thank you. Thank you. I'd like to comment just briefly on propulsion systems. We'll probably be using chemical propulsion systems for a very long time. When we talk about ion systems, what happens when you're, when you're launching from Earth, it takes a tremendous amount of energy to, to break through the, the, the gravity well of the Earth to go to orbit. These are going to be chemical systems for the foreseeable future. What happens with ion systems is that ion systems is a very efficient system. Uh, once, you get, once you get out of the Earth's gravitational pull, and there's very low thrust. I mean, but but the thing is, they constant, un, unlike the unlike the chemical systems, which which go in a big blast, you know, and, and, and take some tremendous amount of energy. The ion systems, once they get into orbit, they keep going and they keep accelerating. They keep accelerating. They keep accelerating. So, but the thing is, it takes it takes a long time to get out of the Earth's influence. And by that time, and we have this really nasty area called the, the Van Allen belts very radiation intensive, probably the most, the worst in the whole solar system surrounding, surrounding the Earth. And so we can't, we want to get people through that, through that period as quickly as possible. We're not going to do it with ion systems, you know, so the, you know, it takes them too long to get out and, and, and to get there. Once, once they're out there, then we can keep them in big cycling orbits like what Buzz, what Buzz Aldrin has been proposing with the cyclers and so on. So, so we're going to be using, my point is we're going to be using chemical systems for a very long time. They're, you know, they're going to be either hydrogen, oxygen, or eventually if we go to Mars, maybe we'll, har we'll, we'll harvest methane and, and, and do this. We're going to need power. One of the things that needs to really be, vitally needs to be developed is, in, is nuclear power for, and whether it's fusion, helium-3, like Jack Schmidt has been proposing, of course, and, and others. But we need power, and we're going to need nuclear power. We don't have access to enough sunlight to electrolyze the water or get the resources and so on. So we're going to have to have, we're going to have modular power systems. Those systems need to be developed on Earth to be tested. Be, uh, the scale we use is like, you know, 100 kilowatts, not megawatts, but, but, but we'll, we'll need nuclear power. One of the problems we're going to have 
is when you launch a nuclear system, if you have an aborted launch and, you ha and, and it lands in somebody's backyard, you have a big international incident. It's a, it's a big concern. Going back to your terraforming things, whenever we talk about altering even the moon or Mars, we're going to have the greenies coming after us big time. We're, we're going to be introducing earth bugs to, to Mars. James Oberg was proposing this probably 30, 40 years ago that we're going to terraform Mars and so on. But I think one thing we can use as a model, we have the Antarctic treaties where, where we've, had, we've had international cooperation and that basically was leveraged into the space station program where we have international cooperation on space station, although China was excluded because of trans technology transfer issues, those kind of concerns. Whether or not we'll be able to bring China into that community in terms of technology transfer, I think it's going to depend a lot on what Donald Trump does now in terms of the, these treaties, in terms of pr pr protecting proprietary information. And, and it's, it's a real biggie. We have, and, and I'll close with one, one big thing. As I er said earlier, space can be a dream or it can be a, you know, we can, we can think of space as nuclear, as, as North Korean uh, uh, missiles coming down on our head. That's, that's space. Or we can think of space as going to, together forward to the moon and Mars and so on. These are very expensive programs. They're very long-term programs. And so one of the concerns is, let's say you team up with China or Russia, and you have this long-term program, and they're going to develop a critical element of that program that you depend upon. They're in the critical path. And now you're at war with them, or you have a Cold War. They don't deliver your, their, their part of the program that's critical to getting there. We have a choice then. Do we say as America, we're going to go anyway. Come on, join us if you'd like. But the, but the problem is when you try to put together a very complex long-term program and you have unreliable agreements with the partners and they, and they can't fulfill their part or they won't or they run out of money or whatever, you've got a problem. I believe that the U.S. has to be in a position to say we're going to go and, and if you want to join us, you can. But you're going to have to demonstrate that you're, you're a reliable partner. And that's going to be a very, very big, uh, very, very big hurdle to, to have. These are enormously long-term programs. They have to be long-term programs, but because they're long-term programs, they force us to, f to look at the future. And I think that's what Lyndon Roche was, was urging us to do. Do you want to, do you want to add anything on that about a? Uh, just briefly on the propulsion, I mean, I think it's, 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 again, it's an issue of the priorities and the vision. I mean, we had a pretty much fully functional nuclear fission rocket in the early 70s, tested every element independently, and instead of putting it together and flying it, we decided to abandon that perspective. So uh, when it comes to propulsion, Mr. LaRouche's perspective, which I thought was very insightful was that you need high thrust fusion propulsion, not, not simply just low thrust ion, but high thrust fusion propulsion for avoiding the radiation issue in space. You know, reduce the travel time to Mars to an issue of weeks uh, instead of the many months which it currently is, which poses all kind of health issues. So I think the, the fundamental issue is just this issue of actually having again a science driver perspective, as Lynn said in that video, as we had in the Kennedy era. I mean, that's really what we have to be fighting for. Given the time that we have, I'm going to ask people to not only be brief, but we're going to take, I think, from each person, this might sound ridiculous, but if each person takes 45 seconds to state a question. Let's hear from everybody, and then we will give a very, very brief response. Okay. This way everyone standing in line has an opportunity, please. Hi, Mrs. Turner from the Bronx. This question is for Professor Cooper. Um, now, I don't think we're ever gonna get these projects done in Africa as much as I would like to, but I hear that Libya was going to do something similar, but they were stopping their tracks. They had a wonderful water system in their country. Gaddafi had a plan to you to make the African go dinar to help Africa get out of this underdevelopment stage and build and build Africa up with the golden dinar just for Africans to get rid of the dollar, get rid of the franc. 
Okay, thank you. Let, let's t we'll take all the questions and then respond to all of them. Every conference speaker's dream. <laughs> Go ahead, Joel. Uh, okay, this is Joel from Houston. On um, the direct fusion drive, I don't know if it came through in the video, but they are using deuterium and helium-3 as their fuel, thus generating charged particles as their fusion products that can be controlled by magnetic fields. Now, when we met with Pelusek and mentioned that uh, Apollo 17 astronaut Harrison Schmidt called for going back to the moon to, to mine helium-3, Pelusek said that the Apollo astronauts were the first helium-3 miners. And uh, if we don't get on the stick, we're going to have to import our helium-3 supplies from China. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure they, were, they will sell it to us at a slight markup. <laughs> and uh, we Thanks, need to Joel. tell Buzz that uh, if he wants to come back from Mars, he can <laughs> ride one of these direct fusion drive rockets. <laughs> and uh, Pelusek is a fellow MIT graduate, so he'd be uh, in good company there. So. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Next, please. First, my name is Pastor Kabul. I'm from New York. Would like to say thank you for this great conference um, with the great, you know, um, music this earlier to celebrate the great man. I'm a new member of this organization, and truly, I'm so so thrilled with that man, you know, great work. Um, but my question is, you know, tonight, the theme of that um, conference says, let us create a new, a new, more human approach for mankind, and I'm asking. Can that be um, um, feasible? Although we having great things that's happening with technology, but we also have, you know, the other side of it. For example, what happened in Cuba? I don't hear people talk about that. And there is, you know, Monsieur, Monsieur Jacques touched on that this morning about the mind control that we didn't touch about that as well. Um, Professor Lebel, we have to we have to move on to the next. Please, please love, love that. I'm sorry. This is just the way we have to do it. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, well, we we could probably get the greenies off our back about terraforming Mars by pointing out that Phobos is doomed, and if we don't intervene, it'll crash into Mars. Uh, so if they want to keep everything in the solar system just the way it is, there's. There's, there's only one alternative, and that's to let us get out there and keep it the way it is. Uh, thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, so the topic of ex uh, space exploration, albeit a truism for the necessity to expand the realm of civilization, uh, to me has a similar ring to the call of manifest destiny, um, leading to one of the softest genocides of cultures you know, roughly 80 million Native Americans uh, on the behest of cultivating a uh, national identity. Um, this is actually a three-part question, really brief. Uh, first part, how can we be sure that pow powerful figures like Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos worth over 140 billion or whatever dollars uh, currently, uh, or other corporations would treat the resources of celestial bodies better than their own home? Uh, part two, uh, who gets left behind or who is allowed to explore space I think that's a pretty important question. Um, and three, you can decide to answer this or not, kind of a joke. Uh, should we be sending war criminals to space using magnetic propulsion systems instead of chemical propulsion? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Hi, Ed from Wilmington, Delaware. Um, I'll try to make this really brief since we've got a short time. Mm -hmm. I'm really glad to hear that we were talking about the uh, strategic defense of the Earth that LaRouche put forward a number of years ago, and, we've, and Ben, you've done some great work on this stuff. And I'm just concerned because I'm not sure people really understand how vital this is, and it may not be as remote a possibility as some people think. But they, you know, the extinction events, they're saying it's so many million years ago. But some people have believe, based on lots of evidence, that we've actually had the Earth has been hit by celestial bodies within the last 15,000 years, twice. 
and cause major disruptions of yeah. the whole planet. So there's a lot of evidence on this, and so I think it's a lot more urgent <laughs> Thank you. than Thank most you. people think. Okay. So if you address that, anybody. And last question. Hi, my name is Innocent Ake. I'm from the Ivory Coast, New Jersey, resident, New Jer Jersey City. Uh, the question is about the rail in Africa. And uh, one of the, qu qu um, the observations that people might not know is the influence of the French government in certain part of Africa. They have their hands on everything, the economy and everything. So how would you go around to deal with these issues to develop this type of project? Thank you. Okay. So the, given our time, um, what's going to happen is I am going to answer all of the questions except for the ones about African Rail, which Hal, who has not spoken on this panel, will respond to. Um, thank you for the point that the DFD is using helium-3. This is very important. As Joel said, helium-3 is a very special fuel because all of its fusion products are charged, allowing its easier use for propulsion and for power generation. Regarding whether it is feasible to achieve our goals, given mind control and these other sorts of things, we are going to have to determine that. Many people would believe that it is not possible for the universe to exist in a state that we can't achieve good in it. I'm among them. Um, good luck with the greenies and Phobos. Um, definitely war criminals should be sent to Mars using perhaps the Star Tram technology. They might not even make it off the planet. And let's uh, turn next to Hal Cooper for a very brief response about the Libyan rail. We're then going to have some announcements uh, on logistical matters and then two important concluding remarks. Um, I'm going to answer the questions that had to do with the rail. Louder. Louder. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll answer the questions about the rail. Uh, yes, the British uh, got their hands in it. They need to be nationalized by the, by the uh, individual governments. And I think ultimately you're going to have rail networks constructed, not by the British, but Chinese in particular, but elsewhere. Um, we also have uh, the, the issue of helium I'll just bring up. I had some information that was presented to me by one of the companies that is, is producing helium. And they tell me that in western Kansas, near Hayes, Kansas, that the helium deposits have 100 to 150 parts per million of helium-3. And can that be recovered by fractional distillation? It certainly can. Okay. Great. So. We are now going to hear the concluding remarks from LaRouche in The Woman on Mars, and then we will have a very special message. So stay tuned. It means a much better way to live than the drab misery, illiteracy, and decay into which our nation has been drifting the past 20 years. Then, 39 years from now, we shall hear the broadcast from Mars announcing that the first permanent colony there is operational. Among those colonists will be some of the children and grandchildren of you watching this broadcast tonight. Many of you will be watching that first television broadcast from that new colony. Already, the woman who will speak to you then from Mars has just recently been born somewhere in the United States. We shall give our nation once again that great future which our children and grandchildren deserve. So with that, I'd also like to offer two bits of thanks. One to all of the staff involved in making this conference a success. And things ran very well. If you are coming to the conference tomorrow, if you've been invited to that, make sure to bring your badge. And last, I would like to thank the founding president of the Schiller Institute, Helga Sepp-LaRouche, for convening this conference. And I'd like to thank her and see if she would have any remarks for us today.
I want to I want to thank all of you, especially for the extreme expression of love which I have felt over the day and also the last couple of days. And that's the one thing which was not mentioned today about Lynn, that he was, in, in one sense, is the most loving person I have ever met. Love in the true sense of love for mankind, passion to improve mankind. And I was so struck, you know, not the first time, because it's one of my absolute favorite pieces of music, the choral fantasy. And for those who understand the German, it says, Nehmt denn hin, ihr schönen Seelen, diese Gaben holder Kunst. Take you beautiful souls, these donations of great art, as a, you know, as a celebration of creativity. And this was actually the leading to the Ninth Symphony for Beethoven's composition, which is a composition of the Ode to Joy. And if you know the text there, it says, all men will become brethren. Above in the skies, there must live a loving father. And it is that celebration you know, of the beauty of the universe and the beauty of mankind which we have been celebrating today. And I think that you know, having listened to the many little comments from Lynn here and there on all these different subjects, I think we should go out of this conference with an absolute solemn commitment to each and all of us become better people because this is the precondition for making the new epoch of mankind because it will start with us. We must take on the torch. We must be the you know, example of what the new renaissance means. And I think, you know, if we improve our relations among each other and celebrate each other's creativity, then, you know, I think we will be the shining example of what the new world, the new epoch, the new paradigm can be. So with that, I want to thank all of you and go out and multiply.